Hey guys, uh, Matt here again. Um, okay, so uh, uh, today's talk will be on the subject of the metaverse. I'm gonna, just going to say metaverse as opposed to the metaverse because that suggests I'm pointing at some specific thing, whereas actually today I'm going to be talking about you know, the concepts, maybe philosophical ideas behind this word metaverse, right? Um, so I'm just going to sort of give a little bit of background about my thinking on this. Um, because I think we can sort of get easily lost and confused about things like virtual realities and metaverses and so on, because um, it, I think it's a mistake to think of them as completely radically new things, right? Because just wherever you are, right, and unless you're in the middle of a desert or, you know, the Arctic or something, um, wherever you are in human society, you, you know, you're surrounded by a certain degree of virtuality right so so you're surrounded by ideas i mean so just just for very really obvious example i'm sat in a, in a room i'm surrounded by curtains tables chairs pianos there is nothing in this room that was not in, invented or not or not envisaged and imagined by a human mind and so there's a sense in which the world we're in is already a kind of virtual world right because we're surrounded by ideas so, uh, you know, that's that's quite interesting. I mean, you could get into some sort of deep philosophical or metaphysical stuff here and say, well, is that true for nature as well? Because are these not um, sort of cognized responses to environmental conditions? Are these not agencies? Right? So are these not ideas as well? You know, <laughs> is the bush, you know, the idea of that entity there, the, 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 the you know, it might be a long term sort of strategic idea as opposed to one that pops into your head and then. You know, um, but <clears throat> an idea nonetheless. But anyway, that's that's another conversation, I think. And it's again, there's a dotted line from this to the um, everything is alive uh, parts one and two, which <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm really plugging those because um, I think there might be some interesting ideas in there. Um, so yeah, this, this metaverse. So I think that the first thing to say is that there's nothing new really about the idea of humans living in some virtual environment, right? So so I've already said that you know pretty much everything in this room is just an idea. So we're already in a kind of semi-virtualized. Um, world anyway right um but what are, what are the key i mean um so oh yeah that's 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 the other thing so this idea of um there's a kind of a role-playing element within the metaverse as well because you have an avatar in these virtual environments so you know even something like just world of warcraft you know you could you could say that um that you know games like that were were the kind of the beginnings of the metaverse because i suppose in some sense let's 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 say what i think the metaverse really means i think the metaverse is that space which allows transitioning from these various other environments, right? So um, there's, a, there's a really, really good, but I mean, you've probably seen the film or if, if not, watch it, it's really good. It's actually a pretty good adaptation of the book, Ready Player One by a chap called um, Ernest Klein, right? And it's a freaking cool book anyway. It's kind of, it uses a hell of a lot of 80s memorabilia and, and you know, retro stuff and there's references to these old games where there's like hidden clues in them and all this kind of stuff but the metaverse that's presented in that um story i think is a pretty good kind of um outline of what the intent for the metaverse that you know the real world metaverse is and that is a kind of an inter interface right so it's um so so imagine you're playing world of warcraft right imagine then being able to you know and you 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 know you've got the headset on and stuff you're in a, a, a virtual world of warcraft right um, and then you could kind of fly from there to work, right? You could then fly from World of Warcraft to work, right? To, to a virtual office where you can have meetings and, um, and stuff with, with you, know, you know, avatars of your bosses and colleagues and so on, right? Um, and then from there, you could um, continue. You could stay in, inside the metaverse and continue on to do something recreational. So some sort of virtual sports or something after that. Um, and, you know, so it's kind of like the metaverse is... Um, loads of different universes wrapped into one overarching space called the metaverse, right? So you could have the universe of World of Warcraft, the universe of Call of Duty, universe of Facebook, universe of YouTube or something, you know, and you can move in between all of these freely. And that that was, that's for me what the metaverse really means. So I think all the stuff we've got now, like things like Decentraland, um, you know, obviously Facebook has called itself meta and there was a big furore about <laughs> how how terrible some of the graphics were um you know in 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 these new kind of virtual environments and stuff and it hasn't really kicked off just yet has it right um i mean a lot of people are suggesting that you know the, the whole web 3.0 thing so the web 3.0 is when when it goes kind of metaverse right so you can kind of you know you can do virtual shopping you can um you can play games you can go to work and all this kind of stuff um seamlessly right and you can do it all with a 
with a headset on or a, or maybe even a, one of these suits because you can i mean for those that aren't aware you probably are everyone's probably aware now but you, you can get these kind of suits um and so not only you know does your avatar respond to your arms and legs and things like that and so you can do motion in these virtual worlds but it also um it can create like it's got loads of little bubbles inside this suit so it can create the effect of someone sort of brushing their hand against your arm and things like that right <laughs> Um, it, it, you know, it, it's getting more and more um, detailed, the sorts of effects that can be created. But yeah, you, you, so we're talking tactile interaction now with other entities. So, um, you know, so, that, so that's that's where it gets really, really interesting. And I think a lot of this stuff is, is based, is really um, derived from storytelling, gaming. And I think that's where the idea of virtuality came from. It's like, you know, so think about, so, you know, sitting around telling a story um, around the campfire, right? That, that's There's something virtual about that because... They're recreating a representation of some complex set of ideas called the story. Um, they're doing it by making funny noises and they're, and they're kind of copying and pasting that stuff into your mind. And you know, the art of a good storyteller is one who can really share that um, emotional kind of um, journey with you. Right? Um, and, you know, so that's already a you know, primitive form of virtualization in some sense. Right. Cave paintings. Yeah. Art. These are sort of virtualizations. You know, it's kind of saying, saying, well, there's a real world version of this, but here's my impression of it. Here's a, a cap. It's, 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 it's data in a sense, isn't it? Right. So, um, you know, I think so. So take something like chess. I mean, you know, in some sense, that those little men on the board, they are your avatars. Right. You know, they represent you within that artificial space, that um, eight by eight, 64 square um environment which reminds me actually i'm just going to take a little side detour into this because there's something about chess boards which is quite fascinating and this this um puzzle actually sort of sorts the wheat from the chaff in terms of well perhaps well it sorts the mathematicians from the philosophers right so here's the challenge right so you've got 64 squares on the chess board and um you've got 32 dominoes okay now each of those dominoes occupies two squares on the chessboard so you can imagine arranging the 32 and there's probably a number of different ways you can do it on that 64 across those 64 squares right um quite quite easily now the question is this right so you can you can do that right um the question is now this if you now remove the two opposing so wh whichever corner squares would be two opposing corner squares um you remove two of those so you've now got 62 squares on the chessboard the question is can you now fit 31 dominoes on that right um, I'll give you the answer. I mean, basically the answer is that, um, I mean, it sounds like you should be able to, because there's still an even number of squares. And, you know, so why couldn't you? You've only taken two squares away, so why can't you now fit the 31? And the reason for it is, is and this is the thing that, that distinguishes mathematicians from ordinary normal people with, with lives and stuff, um, that the mathematician would notice, well, hang on a minute, what colour are those two opposite opposing squares? And then the mathematician said, well, they're both white, right? Um, so you've taken away two whites and zero blacks. And we know that each domino has to occupy a white and a black square. Um, so, yeah, I just did a little bit of a side detour. To, I mean, that's quite an interesting puzzle. And, you know, a good mathematician will always figure that out you know, fairly quickly because they'll look at the facts on the table, whereas the rest of us think, oh, hang on a minute, no, sure, I could do that. And we'd have a go, and trial and error would eventually reveal that we couldn't <laughs> um, until someone was clever enough to notice, ah, hang on a minute, we've lost two white squares and no blacks. Right, so anyway... So I think early things like chess, strategy, and, and eventually things like Dungeons and & Dragons, and then sort of gaming and so on and so forth, these are all part of that journey towards virtualization, right? So it's, it's just this idea of a representation of us in an imagined world, okay? And, you know, I mean, acting is, is this, okay? So again, so there's nothing new about this whole sort of meta, metaverse thing, other than it's a kind of, like I say, it's, a, it's an interconnecting te technological platform that allows you know, smooth travel across all of these different universes. Okay. Um, so, so let's sort of talk about what that means for us as, as mammals and so on. Um, I mean, the first thing you'd say, right, is if let, let's imagine you get a virtual world that is indistinguishable, right? So it's, it's, it's indistinguishable from this one. In fact, you might even say it kind of looks even a bit better. You could say it's hyper real. <laughs> So, you know, the colours are a bit richer. It's always sunny there, right? And you get rainbows and things like that, right? And not only that, let's say that you can just sprout wings in this world, yeah? And um, so you can just launch yourself into the air and, and you won't die, but you can fly, right? And you can have all the visceral sensation of the flying, as I mentioned a minute ago, the, these detailed kind of body pressure suits that can kind of, um, 
create the you know even, even detailed feelings like a sort of fingernail going down your arm i mean so you can create the impression of wind in your hair and all this kind of stuff so you can literally have the um the feel the, the physiological feelings of of lifting off and taking off and landing and stuff right um so the question there is you know why would a human being choose to live in a world in which they couldn't fly okay and so this is where you might get the kind of hippie or or maybe even not so hippie kind of retort that says oh but humans need visceral connection with each other and so on and so forth well what if that can be um uh virtualized as well what if what if we can create a suit that releases certain pheromones or even detect pheromones that are being released from other entities um in this virtual space and actually sends those pheromones to you right <laughs> and so so uh, you know um so we could create body language and create um you know this kind of um what, what do we call it kind of under the bonnet sort of communications that are going on that we don't really understand fully um, we can try to sort of recreate those as well it might go wrong <laughs> you know? but it can certainly go wrong in direct physical contact situations the other thing about to say about this from an ethical point of view is that nobody can kill each other you might be able to kill each other psychologically, and, and, but then, you know, big deal. I mean, that goes on in society anyway, you know. Um, and so um, you can't actually physically die in these spaces, right? Um, unless there's some sort of horrible kind of, you know, shock or trauma to, to the system, or right? Um, so they're safer. You can fly, you can do whatever you like, you can meet anyone you want, you can be anything you want. And, um, you know, this way you say, well, yeah, but it's going to end up kind of like the Matrix, isn't it? Um, you know, everyone just, you know, humans just kind of in, their bodies in these kind of cell like structures just being maintained and their minds being used to kind of, you know, host or interact with this, this, this virtual world. Well, so what? <laughs> it wasn't necessarily, I mean, you know, here's the thing, right? So um, let's let's just take a, a, a brief foray into um, uh, simulation theory. So you may be aware that sort of, I mean, Elon, Elon Musk goes on about this. Right, so this this idea that you say, well, it's, it's possible, right, that society's got so advanced in the past that they've just built one big frickin' simulation, right, and we're in that simulation, yeah. I mean, I think it's an absolutely insane idea, and I think there are some pretty good reasons why this couldn't happen. But but when you think about the direction we're going, um, you know, what if you're a you're a baby that's just born into one of these virtual worlds? And you just don't know any different. So as far as you're concerned, you can just fly, you can do anything you want, go where anymore. Um, you know, um, they wouldn't know they're in a simulation. And that's really the crux of the argument, is that we don't know that we're not in one. And certainly if, if we get advanced enough to build a simulation that's advanced enough that people can't tell the difference, or indeed it's actually a hyper-reality that's preferable to this one, then mm, really, really interesting. So you can say, well, what's going to happen to the human body, right? I'm not sure. Um, it, you know, there's this horrible kind of idea that, well, if we're not using our body anymore properly, then it will, you know, cease to function. We'll end up like these freaky little aliens or kind of embryonic, um, massive-headed creatures, right? But I don't see that happening. I think that we'll, you know, the technology um, will integrate with the technology. So we'll end up with bits of tech inside us, you know, managing, monitoring, um, coordinating, and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, there's a whole host of stuff about the human body that we don't already know. But, I mean, you know, take the cannabinoid system. It's, I mean, that's only really um, been shown to have sort of regulatory uh, functionality in the, in the human body. So there's a kind of mo modulation aspect to it, um, controlling other kind of hormones and responses and things like that. So, um, you know, so things that can enhance that, you know, because we know that the cannabinoid system in sort of over 35-year-olds starts declining, which is, you know, why these um, uh, CBD supplements are quite good, you know in food stuff i'd re recommend them they're really cool um so uh, you know so so sort of little bits of tech that can go around cleaning up the body and so on and so forth i mean i think if anything our bodies will be in better shape <laughs> you know, as a result of this stuff um and you think about all the information so the physiological information that can just be shared with some gigantic super mind that can just um you, you know and cross-reference its data to understand people's conditions it can notice when people are getting sick and so well, hang on this has happened to 5.6 million other people elsewhere and these are the condo these are the treatments that we use with the best success and we're going to do it to you now straight away right so we'll be looked after by ai you know there's um i mean look ai will have to be looked after by us to begin with Right? Because it needs the power, <laughs> you know, and we're, we're the ones shoveling the coal in, into it, right? So it needs us, and it will always need us, um, and until that point at which it doesn't. <laughs> um, but by then, we'll be so entangled with it, sort of transhumanistically, I think that um, 
we'll be so deeply entangled with technology that you know we just we won't recognize ourselves we, we, we look back and see ourselves today as these barbaric kind of hopeless savages to be honest um so what else we got so um yeah we'll, we'll end up in a, in a mad place of kind of um immortality or we'll super minds um you know it, if anyone's ever read the culture novels by ian m banks which is kind of like sci-fi pseudonym um you know these they have these great minds um and these kind of giant ships that just sort of float around i mean they're so super intelligent they end up just knowing everything and to amuse themselves they develop this new thing called metamathics i think where they have these mathematical tournaments where they just try to out compute each other and stuff is pretty insane um so I, th I think we'll end up in a place like that where you know cities will become kind of self-aware in some sense not you know i'm not i'm not asserting that they're going to have the same kind of visceral um felt presence of experience that we do but they will be for all intents and purposes self-aware entities perhaps similarly to forests with their mycelial networks and so on um you know so i you know i'm not it is a bit freaky but it's coming Right. And it's already here, to be honest. Um, th there's there's a lot to be said for these kind of virtual meetings and things like that. So people staying at home instead of you know, polluting the earth and creating, you know, uh, traffic jams and all this kind of stuff. Just stay at home, do stuff virtually. Yeah. Um, you can still live a balanced life and get plenty of exercise and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, um, we just look at image. Remember when the Wii came out? <laughs> you know, you can still sort of keep fit and, and, and op, you know, operate in these virtual environments. Um, what else am I going to say on this? I don't think I've got much else to say. I mean, Web 3.0 is coming, right? Um, I mean, obviously the COVID thing, it made it look like it was going to come a lot quicker because we thought, crikey, we're going into this, you know, the zombie apocalypse and out of the zombies here. And it looked like it was going to go on for, for a long time, um, but it didn't. And so, you know, we're, <laughs> we're back out there among each other. And so perhaps that's why you know, the whole Web 3.0 has taken a bit of a downturn. Um, but then looking at, you know, some of the uh, sort of cryptocurrency, sort of decentralized lands, I think it's Sandbox, you know, they're not doing too badly. A lot of the altcoins have suffered a hell of a lot more in the, the recent downturn. So, and they have a use case. And not only that, think about how many of our kids, I mean, I don't know, you know, my kids have played this um, Roblox game. I played it with them and it's actually extremely good fun in places, right? And it's, um, you know, it's kind of virtual gaming. There's millions and millions of different things that the kids themselves can write their own software and stories. So it's kind of encouraging development practices and so on as well. So it's cool. Um, but kids are going to be so completely used to that, right? And there's virtual currency on there, there's virtual monetary systems, there's traders, there's businesses setting up inside them and so on. So, you know, this is going to be the norm um, for the people who are running society in 10 years. So, you know, what, whatever we think about the quaint old little, you know, shops of the past and so on, this is where we're going. Um, there's a lot of big names that have gone into decentralized, so people like Paris Hilton, there's loads of sort of cutting edge, you know, sort of popular DJs, obviously, whose names I will not know. Uh, but there's some, there's, some, there's some big businesses going in there. I think one or two have pulled out, to be fair. Um, but, you know, just with every, every new um, advance, it, it just sort of takes a while for it to bed in. And I think that's what we're doing at the moment. Um, it's weird, because, I mean, I used to be massively into gaming, so things like World of Warcraft and... I mean, I actually think that some of the friendships that we built, you know, in these raiding guilds and stuff, we used to do PvP, it got a bit nasty at times, to be honest, it was highly competitive. But some of the bonds you built with these people were just absolutely unbelievable, you know. Um, you know, we'd be we'd be um, sort of raiding boss, it'd be 40 people on um, sort of voice over IP, I can't remember what it was called at the time, VoIP or something. And, um, you know, there was like real structure and we had to have control a chain of command there was kind of like the guild there was the raid leader but then each of the classes had so i was a warlock so there was, and i had a, a warlock leader who kind of coordinated our activities and told me what to do and who to banish and who to, who to blow up and stuff and um you know it was absolutely amazing it's it, it just you know there's a lot of these guys i mean because and we were kind of frowned upon by our friends and you know it's like you sad people get out and get some fresh air right and you're probably right to a degree but some of the, you know, you think these aren't just geeks living in their, you know, mum's sort of basements. These are guys who work for banks, you know, the government, and a lot of them have gone on to have really, really fantastic careers. And they actually say that, you know, their experience in running these guilds and managing these these raids, which were freaking intense. And, you know, there'd be quite a lot of arguments and tears and stuff at times, you know. <clears throat> and then arguments about who was getting all the all the epic raid gear and, you know, I want that, you know, legendary wand, give it to me and all this kind of stuff. And, um so, yeah, yeah, um, but it, you know, actually develop these people, develop their leadership skills, creative thinking, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, some of the problems in the games are incredibly difficult to solve, right? So there's that as well. Um, I mean, look, this is the direction of travel, whether we like it or not. Um, but it doesn't mean we can't go and meditate in the forest, right? 
Um, I mean, then the question is, well, what's the difference between meditating in the real forest and meditating in a virtual forest? If you can guarantee that all of those physiological effects you get from the former can be replicated, that can be um, generated in the latter. And again, here we, here we have the um, metaphysical debate. It depends on your metaphysics, doesn't it? Yeah. Because for the physicalists, if we said, well, if you could re replicate every single physiological experience they're having in the real forest, then that person, for all intents and purposes, is in a real forest. And it doesn't matter that they're not, because the effects are the same. Whereas maybe for an idealist or a panpsychist, you'd say, well, yeah, but, you know, those th things that you're experiencing in the real forest, they are true con they are true agencies. And there's something about the things you're experiencing in the virtual ones that are true agencies as well, but not in the same way. Anyway, it's confusing stuff. That's probably enough for today. I uh, hope you enjoy. The weather's fantastic here. And I've got shitloads of work to do, so uh, better crack on and do it. Take care, guys. Bye.